Good evening, it's Thursday, February 8th. Israeli airstrikes kill over a dozen people overnight, hours after Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejects Hamas's ceasefire terms and vows to expand the offensive into the southern Gaza town of Rafa. More than half of Gaza's population has fled to the city on the mostly sealed border with Egypt, which warns that any ground operation there or mass displacement across the border would undermine its four-decade-old peace treaty with Israel. The United States Supreme Court seems poised to reject attempts to kick former President Donald Trump off the 2024 ballot. A definitive ruling for the leading Republican candidate for president would largely end efforts in Colorado, Maine, and other states to prevent his name from appearing on the ballot. In more than two hours of arguments today, both conservative and liberal justices raised questions about whether Trump can be disqualified from being president again. A special counsel report finds evidence that President Joe Biden willfully retained and shared highly classified materials when he was a private citizen, including documents about military and foreign policy in Afghanistan. That's according to a Justice Department report that nonetheless says no criminal charges are warranted for Biden or for anyone else. Ukraine's president replaces his top general in a shakeup aimed at reigniting momentum in the deadlocked war with Russia, which is grinding into its third year as the country grapples with shortages of ammunition and personnel and struggles to maintain support for its war effort from the West. The Senate begins work on a package of wartime funding for Ukraine and other U.S. allies, including Israel, but doubts remain about the level of support from Republicans who rejected a carefully negotiated compromise that also included border enforcement policies. And a Russian opposition candidate who's called for peace in Ukraine will not be allowed to appear on the ballot for the upcoming presidential election to face Vladimir Putin. From Pacifica Radio and the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. As the war in Gaza grinds on in its fifth month, Israeli forces are pressing their offensive action south of Gaza, killing at least 13 people in Rafah on the border with Egypt, the main entry point for humanitarian aid, and where more than half of Gaza's 2.2 million population has fled seeking refuge. The Kuwaiti hospital said two women and five children were among those killed in the overnight airstrikes. Karen Chamas reports. Israeli airstrikes have killed over a dozen people overnight in Rafa, where more than half of Gaza's population has fled on the mostly sealed border with Egypt. Rafa is also the main entry point for humanitarian aid. Egypt has warned that any ground operation there or mass displacement across the border would undermine its four-decade-old peace treaty with Israel. The strikes come hours after Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejected Hamas's ceasefire terms and vowed to expand the offensive into the southern Gaza town. I'm Karen Chamas. President Biden's National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby says... The U.S. has seen no hard evidence that Israel plans a major offensive on the city of Rafa. We've seen no plans that would convince us that they are uh, about to or imminently going to conduct any kind of major operations in Rafa. But Kirby says the Biden administration has warned the Israelis that because of the hundreds of thousands of displaced Palestinians who have been forced into the Rafah area, there should be no major attack on the city. Absent any uh, full consideration uh, of protecting civilians at that scale in Gaza, um, military operations right now would be a disaster for those people, and it's not something that we would support. 
John Kirby is the spokesperson for President Biden's National Security Council. Tor Wenesland is the United Nations Special Coordinator for the Middle East peace process. He says it's now impossible to deliver any aid into Gaza. The humanitarian system is not designed and set up to carry the delivery of all goods into Gaza for 2.2 million people. We will not be able to have Gaza properly supplied unless there is a private sector delivery into the Strip. In order for that to happen, geography needs to be taken seriously. As the U.N. warns of a looming famine in Gaza, a grain mill there has resorted to using bird feed to make flour due to a severe shortage of wheat. Supplies are incredibly slow to arrive in Gaza due to Israel's blockade at the Rafah border. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres held a press conference today in which, among other things, he spoke about the ongoing war in Gaza. Scott Baba reports. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that UN aid efforts in Gaza are facing increasing difficulties as the war in the territory continues. Despite some limited steps, our humanitarian operations continue to face denials of access, delays, impediments, and multiple dangers, including live fire. One of our convoys was damaged by Israeli naval artillery earlier this week, And just 10 out of 61 planned eight convoys to the north reached their destination in January. Let's be clear. Denial of humanitarian access means denial of humanitarian relief for civilians. Guterres said he was particularly concerned about Israel's apparent intention of moving the fight to Rafah, a once designated safe zone where much of Gaza's population has fled to. Half of Gaza's population is now crammed into Rafah. They have nowhere to go. They have no homes and they have no hope. They are living in overcrowded makeshift shelters in unsanitary conditions without running water, electricity and adequate food supplies. And all of this underscores the need for full respect for international humanitarian law, including the protection of civilians and ensuring that essential needs are met. While taking questions from reporters, Guterres defended earlier comments calling the war in Gaza collective punishment. Israeli leaders have been telling repeatedly they are not fighting the Palestinian people, they are fighting Hamas. If that is the case, I cannot understand how this is conducted in such a way that has led in Gaza to reportedly around 28,000 people killed, to 75% of the population displaced, and to a level of destruction of entire neighborhoods at the level that it has happened. I think that there is something wrong in the way the military operations have been conducted. Guterres said he often feels powerless in his role to take direct action to help those in need. My worst frustration to see suffering at such a large scale and to know that I have not the power to stop it. But it is a reality. I have not the power to stop it. I can raise my voice and I do it. I can sometimes convene, but people need to be willing to be convened. Guterres also fielded questions from reporters about recent controversies at the U.N. defending the choice to fire workers with UNRWA, the U.N. Palestinian aid agency, who were accused of working with Hamas to attack Israel. He argued that it was not worth the risk to keep those workers if the allegations were true and said that matters could be rectified if an investigation cleared them. At the same time, he noted that Israel has yet to offer the U.N. its evidence that the 12 individuals had helped Hamas attack Israel. I'm Scott Baba, Pacifica Radio, KPFA. Germany dispatched a powerful air defense frigate today to join a European Union naval mission in the Red Sea that will be launched in mid-February to protect merchant ships from attacks by Yemen's Iran-backed Houthi militia. 
Many commercial shippers have diverted vessels following attacks by the Houthis, who control much of Yemen, and say they're acting in solidarity with the Palestinians as Israel and Hamas wage war in Gaza. Karen Chamas reports. A German military frigate is heading towards the Red Sea for a planned EU mission to protect ships from Houthi rebels. At the North Sea port of Wilhelmshaven, the German frigate is given a warm send-off as a band chorus wafts into the horizon. The frigate, known as the Hessen, has about 240 service people on board. The aim is to have it in place once the EU mission to protect merchant shipping is given the official go-ahead. Its involvement in the EU operation can only take place once the German parliament has approved a mandate for the ship to join in, which is expected at the end of February. Jan Christian Kack, a German Navy vice admiral, said the Hessen is the ship that is needed in this situation. There is no unit in the German Navy that is better prepared, better trained and better equipped for this. The Iranian-backed Houthis have waged a persistent campaign of drone and missile attacks on commercial ships over Israel's offensive in Gaza against Hamas, which began in October. I'm Karen Chamas. Last night, hundreds rallied in New York to oppose the war in Gaza, and arrests were made after activists with groups like Jewish Voice for Peace and other allies blocked President Joe Biden's motorcade as he was en route in New York City to attend campaign fundraisers. Demonstrators calling for a ceasefire in Gaza in New York City last night. The Minneapolis City Council overrode, overrode a mayoral veto today and approved a resolution that does call for a ceasefire in Gaza and for an end to U.S. military funding for Israel. The office of Mayor Jacob Fry, who is Jewish, said he has been clear and consistent in his support for a ceasefire But he had vetoed the ceasefire resolution last week because he was concerned about its language being one-sided and about rising anti-Semitism in the city of Minneapolis and beyond. The resolution calls on state and federal authorities to advance a full, immediate, and permanent ceasefire, provide urgently needed humanitarian aid, stop U.S. military funding to Israel, release Israeli hostages taken by Hamas, and release thousands of Palestinians held indefinitely without cause and without trial in Israeli military prisons. Minneapolis is the latest large U.S. city to approve such a non-binding resolution, following Chicago, Atlanta, Detroit, and San Francisco in recent weeks. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky replaced his top general, Valery Zaluzhny, today in a shakeup aimed at reigniting momentum in the deadlocked war with Russia, which is grinding into its third year. And as Ukraine grapples with shortages of ammunition and of military personnel, and is struggling to maintain its support from the West. Megumi Lim reports from Kiev. Zelensky, in his video address to the country on Thursday, said Zaluzhny will be replaced by Alexander Sirsky, uh, the head of Ukraine's ground forces. And Zelensky, in that video, described Sirsky as having both experience in defense and offense, crediting him with conducting operations to defend Kiev and liberating Kharkiv uh, during the first year of war. And Zelensky explained that the country was in need of urgent change as it enters its third year of war against Russia. He said the second year of war saw some successes in weakening Russia's Black Sea fleet and proving that Ukraine can regain control of the skies, but had unfortunately failed to achieve its goals on land. Megumi Lim in Kyiv. A Russian opposition candidate who's called for peace in Ukraine will not be allowed to appear on the ballot in the upcoming presidential elections along with current President Vladimir Putin. Karen Chamas has a story. 
Boris Nadezhdin, a local legislator in a town near Moscow, has been refused permission to run as a candidate in Russia's upcoming presidential elections. He was required by law to gather at least 100,000 signatures in support of his candidacy. The Central Election Commission declared more than 9,000 signatures submitted by Nadezhdin's campaign invalid, which was enough to disqualify him. Nadezhdin has openly called for a halt to the conflict in Ukraine and for starting a dialogue with the West. I'm Karen Chamas. Nadezhdin has openly called for a halt to the nearly two-year-old war in Ukraine and for starting a dialogue with the West. Thousands of Russians had lined up across the country last month to sign papers supporting his candidacy, an unusual show of opposition sympathies in the rigidly controlled political landscape. The 60-year-old Nadezhdin, whose name is a form of the Russian word for hope, gave a sense of optimism to those opposing the war, and many of them stood in bitterly cold temperatures across the country last month to sign his petitions. Starting peace talks with Kiev was among his campaign promises, as was the idea that Russia is not a besieged fortress and needs to pivot toward working with the West rather than being in confrontation with it. Speaking to officials at the election commission today, Nadezhdin had asked them to postpone their decision. They declined. He said he would appeal his disqualification in court. As Pakistan votes to elect a new government, Internet services have been suspended across the country due to heightened security concerns, according to officials. Pakistan's polling body claims the Electoral Commission did not instruct the government to cut off Internet services. Here Mustafa reports from Islamabad, Pakistan. Internet Monitor NetBlock says, Real-time data shows blackouts are now in effect in multiple regions in addition to mobile network disruption. Pakistan's Interior Ministry says it decided to temporarily suspend mobile internet services nationwide as a result of terror incidents in the country. It says these security measures are essential to maintain law and order and to deal with possible threats. Voters claim this is impacting their ability to cast their ballots freely. Many say they have been unable to do last-minute research on which party they want to vote for and what their poll symbol is. Experts claim jailed Prime Minister Imran Khan's party PTI would be the most affected by the move, as it has relied heavily on social media to reach out to young voters. Hira Mustafa, Islamabad. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online, kpfa.org. Donald Trump's eligibility for the presidential ballot is in the hands of the U.S. Supreme Court. The nine justices today heard arguments in the case of Trump versus Anderson. That's an appeal from a Colorado State Supreme Court ruling that bars former President Donald Trump from that state's presidential primary ballot under the Insurrection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Trump's lawyers say the law does not apply to the former president, while Colorado's Secretary of State says electing an insurrectionist could allow him to dismantle democracy from within. Christopher Martinez reports. The 14th Amendment of the Constitution bans from office certain former officials who have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the Constitution, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But when Colorado's Supreme Court ruled that that meant removing Donald Trump from the state's presidential primary ballot, Trump took it to the Supreme Court in the case of Trump versus Anderson. At Thursday's hearing, the former president was represented by Jonathan Mitchell, a lawyer perhaps best known for his work on Texas radical abortion law, SB 9. He made two arguments. First, that the Insurrection Clause, also known as Section 3, does not apply to a former president. The second reason is that Section 3 cannot be used to exclude a presidential candidate from the ballot, even if that candidate is disqualified from serving as president under Section 3 because Congress can lift that disability after the candidate is elected, but before he takes office. A state cannot exclude any candidate for federal office from the ballot on account of Section 3, and any state that does so 
is violating the holding of term limits by altering the Constitution's qualifications for federal office. The justices seemed to dismiss Mitchell's arguments pretty quickly. They spent more time discussing other reasons Trump should be allowed on the ballot. Justice Elena Kagan is one of the three liberal justices on the high court. I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. In other words, you know, this question of whether a former president is disqualified for insurrection uh, to be president again is, you know, just say it, it sounds awfully national to me. Um, so whatever means there are to enforce it would suggest that they have to be federal national means. Chief Justice John Roberts suggested that upholding Colorado's ruling against Trump could lead to political retaliations. In very quick order, I would expect, um, although my predictions have never been correct, uh, I would expect <laughs> that uh, you know, a goodly number of states will say, uh, whoever the Democratic candidate is, you're off the ballot, and others, uh, the, for the Republican candidate, you're off the ballot, and it'll come down to just a handful of states that are going to decide the presidential election. That's a pretty daunting consequence. Reaction to the case was swift. Republican Congressmember Roger Marshall of Kansas spoke to reporters outside the court building, even before the hearing. What we know is going to happen here is this is going to embolden the American people even more, that they're going to get out and vote. You know what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. This is going to make President Trump even stronger. He called the issue another political witch hunt by the Biden administration. But what's at risk for the future is if they would call this an insurrection, then why wouldn't we call 10 million people crossing the border illegally an insurrection? Why wouldn't we call the situation where you take away your freedoms of speech, your freedoms of religion, your freedoms to bear arms, why wouldn't we call that an insurrection as well? Nearby protesters who heard the comments were not impressed. So you really think do people we, on the border to, uh, is an insurrection? What kind of education have you had, sir? When you have tens of thousands of people attack the state capitol, people are killed because of that, beaten, that was an insurrection. And Trump called it, you know it, the whole world knows it. And to try and like, confuse people by saying the stuff on the border is an insurrection makes you sound like an idiot. Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold also spoke outside the court, but after the hearing. She says insurrectionists, if elected, could dismantle democracy from within. She hopes the justices will protect democracy from what she calls the danger of another Trump presidency. We are only here because there's an unprecedented situation. A president who decided that he would steal the presidency from the American people. I don't believe that the president is a get-out-of-jail-free card, and I hope the justices hold him accountable. As for Trump, he did not attend the hearing, but he spoke to reporters from his home in Florida. And it's an honor to have you at Mar-a-Lago. I hope you like it. Uh, it's worth a little more than $18 million. Like Congressmember Marshall, Trump took issue with the term insurrection. This was an insurrection if it was an insurrection, which there were no guns, there were no anything except for the fact that they shot Ashley Babbitt. Somebody from at least four shot Ashley Babbitt. So unnecessary, so sad, so horrible. He framed the Colorado ballot case in the context of his other pending court cases, which he dismisses as phony. Every one of these cases you see comes out of the White House. It comes out of Biden. It's election interference, and it's really very sad. He also made his argument for presidential immunity, saying there are some very bad people and an opposition party that he says will do things that are very bad. If you don't have immunity, you can be blackmailed. You can be, as a president, they'll say, if you don't do this, this, and this, we're going to indict you as soon as you leave office. You cannot allow a president to be out there without immunity. If they don't have immunity, you don't have a presidency. Over the course of the two-hour hearing, the justices seemed inclined to let Trump remain on Colorado's ballot. Colorado's presidential primary is scheduled for March 5th, and whether Trump has a place on the ballot is now in the hands of the Supreme Court. Trump, who appointed three of the nine justices when he was president, says he's a believer in the Supreme Court. Can you take the person that's leading everywhere and say, hey, we're not going to let you run? You know, I think that's pretty tough to do, but uh, I'm leaving it up to the Supreme Court. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez.
The Nation Magazine's National Affairs correspondent John Nichols joined KPFA host Mitch Jezerich on his Letters and Politics program today following the two-hour-long Supreme Court oral arguments. I thought it was an extraordinary hearing uh, and uh, worth listening to, which you can't always say about Supreme Court hearings. Some of them uh, are arcane and obscure, et cetera. But this one actually got us deep into the uh, questions about Donald Trump's qualification to be president of the United States. And from a sort of broader historical standpoint, into the questions of how you get on a ballot in America and how you are qualified or disqualified. It was a very constitutionally focused discussion that took us into reflections on the Reconstruction era and uh, even mentions of great historians like Eric Boner. Uh, so it was it was a worthy hearing. I do have to tell you that uh, I come out of it pretty much where I was going in, and that is that if you read the Constitution clearly, uh, I, I think that that Donald Trump disqualified himself. I think that that you can make the case for his disqualification. However, uh, that's my view. It does not appear that that will be the view of the Supreme Court. If you followed the questioning, uh, it was pretty clear that the conservative justices and maybe even one or two of the more liberal justices uh, were sympathetic to uh, the argument that Trump should be on the ballot. A main contention of Donald Trump's attorneys before the court was the fact that the 14th Amendment does not specifically name the president as an official who could be disqualified for insurrection. But the nation's national affairs correspondent Nichols does not think that will be the argument that keeps Trump on the ballot, although that's exactly what Nichols thinks will be the ultimate ruling of the court and probably not by a narrow margin. Um, I'd be shocked if it was if, if there were any more than three uh, voting to uphold Colorado Supreme Court's decision, and I think it could very well be less than that. Um, it could be two, it could be one, it could be it, it could in fact be nine zero. Although I, I somewhat doubt that. We'll see where it ends up. I think that uh, Sonia Soto, Justice Sotomayor's questioning pointed, in my view, toward a, a, a much more uh, open approach to to this question than, than some of the other justices. I, I want to come off what you were just playing there, though, because that's significant. Um, I think that, that one of the confusions as regards the mention of the presidency or the lack of mention of the presidency in this uh, particular amendment is an evolution of how we think about the presidency. And uh, you understand that Today, we have an imperial presidency. We have a president that is so overwhelmingly powerful that they launch wars without declarations and, and, and you know, have a, a much broader power, a much broader executive branch. Um, in, in that period, the uh, better part of 150 years ago, uh, there was the understanding of the president. There was a different understanding of the presidency. It was a more limited understanding. Uh, still, the the you know, chief executive, et cetera, the person who implements things. But Congress had much more of a sense of its authority. And uh, and so I think that it's very relevant what Murray brought up there. That in the deliberations, yes, somebody said, well, should we put the, should we put the word president or should we put vice president in here? And uh, the person who was pushing the bill or pushing the amendment said, no, you don't have to. We say officers of the United States. And that clearly puts the president, it includes the president, cabinet members and others. And, um, and I think does, that's, but it does uh, name others. It does name specifically other positions. Of course it positions. does. But, but, and I, and you can, we can deliberate, boy, you know, Mitch, if you want to go through the constitution, find mis, misworded things and things that maybe they might've done better, uh, in, had they revisited, of course, remember the constitution was amended immediately after its acceptance or even before its acceptance to include a bill of rights and then was amended in the early part of the 19th century because they realized they had created a disastrous approach to choosing the vice president, right? Uh, and you ended up with Aaron Burr shooting Alexander Hamilton and things of that nature. So, uh, you know, the bottom line is that I, I think this is an, in my opinion, this is an overplayed concern. The fact of the matter is, it is unimaginable to me 
and I think unimaginable to a lot of legal scholars, if you read the briefs that went in on this case, that the, the Congress of the United States and the states would go through the process of enacting an amendment to the Constitution to make sure that someone who tried to overturn the government didn't you know, get into a position of power, right? Uh, and then say, oh yeah, but we don't mean the presidency, right? Or we don't mean the vice presidency. That's such an absurd construct that uh, I, I would be very dubious, frankly, uh, about the prospect that the court would hang its decision on this. Now, they may entertain it, right? They may talk about it here in this hearing, but boy, if they came down with, that's their ruling, Colorado can't do this because it wasn't mentioned there, um, I think the court's ongoing legitimacy crisis would be, <laughs> would continue uh, and perhaps even be extrapolated. Much more likely, in my opinion, is that they go a, another route and that that other route uh, may well be, intriguingly enough, one that that they did sort of in Bush v. Gore back in 2000, which is to say, look, this isn't a precedent in a big way. We just want to kind of avoid chaos, right? We want to avoid uh, an, an unresolved issue becoming a chaotic force in our processes of elections and presidential transition. That's essentially a big part of what they did in Bush v. Gore. And um, in so doing, you might see the court try and push this back on Congress, right? And say, you know, you people need to define some of these terms, right? But we're not going to do it, right? We're just going to say practically that this is the wrong time, the wrong venue to do this. Uh, that's my bet. Articles of the Nation magazine with KPFA's Mitch Jezrich on today's Letters and Politics program. A federal judge has denied Trump White House official Peter Navarro's bid to remain out of prison while he appeals his contempt of Congress conviction for refusing to cooperate with the congressional investigation into the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. Navarro was sentenced last month to four months in prison after being found guilty of defying a subpoena for documents and a deposition from the House January 6th committee. He had asked to be free while he fights that conviction in higher courts. Jackie Quinn reports. Peter Navarro, a close advisor to then-President Trump, was found guilty of defying a subpoena issued by the committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. He was sentenced to four months in prison. Navarro filed an appeal last month. His comments afterward drowned out by detractors outside the courthouse. Whether a senior White House aide and alter ego of the president can be compelled to testify. A U.S. District Judge, Amit Mehta, says Navarro must report to serve his sentence unless a federal appeals court intervenes. Navarro had said his prosecution stems from political bias, but the judge called that a, quote, cynical, self-serving claim. I'm Jackie Quinn. Navarro was the second Trump aide convicted of contempt of Congress charges. Former White House advisor Steve Bannon previously received a four-month sentence. He's free pending appeal. A House committee spent 18 months investigating the insurrection, interviewing over 1,000 witnesses, holding 10 hearings, and obtaining more than 1 million pages of documents. In its final report, the panel ultimately concluded that Trump criminally engaged in a multi-part conspiracy to overturn the election results and failed to act to stop his supporters from storming the Capitol. Trump has been criminally charged by special counsel Jack Smith with conspiring to overturn his 2020 election loss to President Biden. Trump has denied any wrongdoing and says it's politically motivated. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KFCF Fresno, online, kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast. There's each night at 6 o'clock. I'm Mark Miracle. A special counsel report released today found evidence that President Joe Biden willfully retained and shared highly classified information when he was a private citizen, including about military and foreign policy in Afghanistan, but also concluded that criminal charges were not warranted. The report from special counsel Robert Hur resolves the criminal investigation that had shadowed Biden's presidency for the last year. 
but its bitingly critical assessment of Biden's handling of sensitive government records and unflatteringly characterizations of his Biden's memory will spark fresh questions about the president's competency and age. Beyond that, the harsh findings will almost certainly blunt Biden's ability to forcefully condemn Donald Trump, Biden's likely opponent in November's presidential election, over a criminal indictment charging the former president with illegally hoarding classified records at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida. Despite abundant differences between the cases, Trump immediately seized on the special counsel's report today to portray himself as a victim of a two-tiered system of justice. Even as Hur found evidence that Biden willfully held onto and shared with a ghostwriter highly classified information, the special counsel devoted much of his report to explaining why he did not believe the evidence met the standard for criminal charges, including a high probability that the Justice Department would not be able to prove Biden's intent beyond a reasonable doubt, citing, among other things, an advanced age that, they said, made him forgetful and the possibility of innocent explanations for the records that they could not refute. The White House said after the report was released that Biden uh, would deliver a statement from the White House this evening, which he did. Biden's lawyers blasted the report for what they said were inaccuracies and gratuitous swipes at the president. More from Sagar Magani in Washington. The documents were found in a cardboard box in his Delaware garage, in his basement, and elsewhere. It's a hard assessment of his handling of sensitive material, but it also clears the president of any criminal wrongdoing. The special counsel, in my case, decided against moving forward with any charges. And this matter is now closed. The president at a Democratic retreat saying he cooperated fully with the year-long probe. It's separate from the one charging Donald Trump with illegally hoarding top secret records at his Florida estate. Biden's probe likely blunts his efforts to hammer Trump for his as they move toward a likely November showdown. Trump says this is a two-tier justice system, and Biden's case was far more severe than his. Sagar Magani, Washington. The Senate voted today to begin work on a package of wartime funding for Ukraine, Israel, and other U.S. allies. But doubts remained about support from Republicans, who earlier had rejected a carefully negotiated compromise that also included border enforcement policies. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer called the latest vote a good first step, pledging the Senate would keep working until the job's done. But the legislation's path remains uncertain because Senate leaders had not agreed to a process to limit the debate time for the bill, meaning it could take days, possibly longer, for the Senate to come to a final vote on the measure. The vote to begin work on the package cleared 67 to 32, needing two-thirds vote, with 17 Republicans along with Democrats voting to move forward. Reporter Sagar Magani with more from Washington. The Senate has voted to start work on a last-ditch effort to fund Ukraine, Israel, and other allies. It comes after Republicans this week rejected a compromise funding package that also included border enforcement policies. This is a shameful week for the Senate. With Arizona Democrat Mark Kelly saying lawmakers failed the American people yet again by putting politics over security. Now the Senate will take up a separate wartime funding package. This is a good first step. And Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says the Senate will keep working on the bill until the job is done. Still, Senate Republicans are divided over the bill, and even if it passes, the road's expected to be even tougher in the GOP-led House. Sagar Magani, Washington. Independent Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont was among the no votes uh, on the question of moving forward with the supplemental bill. In a statement, he said he would not support the $10 billion in the package in aid to Israel, saying, but 
While Israel has a right to defend itself against Hamas terrorism, it does not have the right to go to war with the entire Palestinian people. Sanders said children are starving because Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's right-wing government is preventing desperately needed food and water from getting into Gaza. Self-help author and spiritual guru Marianne Williamson has suspended her long-shot Democratic primary challenge to President Joe Biden. Part of her campaign pledge was to develop a Department of Peace. She ran for president in 2020, made national headlines calling for a moral uprising against then-President Donald Trump. Williamson's second White House bid featured the same non-traditional campaigning style, but she struggled to raise money and was plagued by staff departures. Reporter Nick Harper has more. Marion Williamson's chances always looked incredibly slim, going up against incumbent President Joe Biden. So far in primary season, she's barely registered, winning only around 2% of the vote in South Carolina in Saturday's primary. Suspending her bid, she told supporters her campaign had not been in vain. Williamson, who was once Oprah Winfrey's spiritual advisor, also competed in the 2020 election. One main challenger now remains in the race against Biden for the Democratic nomination, Congressman Dean Phillips. I'm Nick Harper in Washington. Donald Trump is expected to sweep Nevada's Republican caucuses tonight, which would give him a third straight win in presidential primaries and to deliver more delegates that he needs to clinch the nomination. Republican challenger Nikki Haley decried the caucuses as rigged for Trump and decided instead of going to the caucuses to instead list her name in a purely symbolic Nevada Republican primary on Tuesday, where she lost to the none of these candidates option, which was also on the ballot. Haley's now trying to win her home state of South Carolina's primary. She was once the governor of the state. State of Pennsylvania's primary election is less than 90 days away, and a nonpartisan grassroots organization there is getting the word out to residents about the importance of voting and voter registration. Danielle Smith reports. More than 8.7 million Pennsylvania voters could participate in the local municipal primaries on April 23rd. Kadita Kennard is founding CEO of the new PA Project Education Fund and the new Pennsylvania Project. She says more than 2.1 million eligible Pennsylvanians are still unregistered or at risk of losing their right to vote because they haven't voted in a while. She adds their ongoing commitment throughout this year is to register more voters in the Commonwealth. This year, we we do have an aspirational goal of registering 60,000 Pennsylvanians to vote. And 60,000 for us is a doable number because we are a statewide organization. She adds Pennsylvania does not have same-day voter registration. Residents have to register before the strict deadline of April 8th to vote in the primary. The last day to request a mail-in or absentee ballot is April 16th. Kennard says Black History Month is a critical time to remember that voter registration wasn't meant to be inclusive, but to restrict voting access. She emphasizes the group's year-round primary focus is not only on voter registration, but also civic education and mobilization, especially in marginalized communities that may still face voting barriers. We center Black, Indigenous, and other people of color in this work. We center the immigrant community. We center the youth, 17 to 35-year-olds here in Pennsylvania, and we center them with intention because they're the ones who um, are consistently left out of the democratic process. Kennard says over the span of two years, her organizations have registered more than 33,000 Pennsylvanians. She adds it's important for Pennsylvanians to register to vote and participate at the polls. She emphasizes that it's never too late, as demonstrated by two centenarians who registered for the first time last year. I'm Danielle Smith. And this is the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online, kpfa.org. I'm glad it did. A bad situation. 
lot of sense I woke up and found out you had this music break is brought to you by Betty's Night Inn with host Betty Beasley, which airs Thursdays at 10 p.m. We now return to the Pacifica Evening News. A Republican member of the Wisconsin Elections Commission who has faced calls to resign after falsely declaring that former President Trump won the state claimed today that no white Republican has done more for the black community than me. Bob Spindell made the remark after two members of the public called for him to resign during a commission meeting. Spindell has faced calls for his resignation since he served as a fake Trump elector and later bragged about efforts to suppress black and Latino voter turnout in the city of Milwaukee. New research from a campaign finance tracking group shows foreign corporations are investing heavily in statewide elections. Montana is one of a half dozen states where the spending was most prevalent. Mark Moran has the story. Open Secrets, which follows money in American politics, focused on companies owned at least 1% by a single foreign investor or at least 5% by a group of foreign investors who were donating to statewide elections. Open Secrets editorial investigations manager Anna Masolia says voters could easily assume that companies active in Montana campaigns are totally owned by U.S. investors, but that is often not the case. For Montana, companies like Altria Group, Barrett Gold Corp, Sandfire Resources, Reynolds American, companies that we don't necessarily think of as being foreign, but are indeed foreign-influenced. The report shows six states, Montana, Colorado, Michigan, Minnesota, New York, and Washington, received $163 million in foreign funding between 2018 and 2022. Washington topped the list at $67 million. Masodia argues the increase in foreign money in state elections is the result of the U.S. Supreme Court's Citizens United ruling, which loosened the rules for corporate and union campaign donations, and in the process crippled state campaign finance laws. One of the issues that some activists have raised about foreign influence companies participating in elections is the fact that they may be beholden to foreign owners or foreign investors who do not necessarily have American interests at heart. Montana just increased its campaign contribution levels. As of this year, individuals and political action committees can donate $1,120 to a governor and lieutenant governor candidate, $790 to a candidate for statewide office, and $450 to a candidate for other public offices. This is Mark Moran. The Federal Communications Commission today outlawed robocalls that contain voices generated by artificial intelligence, a decision that sends a clear message that exploiting the technology to scam people and to mislead voters won't be tolerated. The unanimous ruling targets robocalls made with AI voice cloning tools under the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. 1991 law restricting junk calls that use artificial and pre-recorded voice messages. Shelley Adler reports. You may remember that AI-generated robocall that mimicked President Biden's voice to discourage people from voting at last month's New Hampshire primary? Well, the FCC wants to put an end to that. The agency says it will find companies that use AI voices in their calls or block the service providers that carry them. It also opens the door for call recipients to file lawsuits and gives state attorneys general a new mechanism to crack down on violators. Those who break the law can face steep fines, maxing out at more than $23,000 a call. I'm Shelley Adler. The average global temperature has, for the first time, breached the one and a half degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels mark for an entire year. 2024 saw the hottest January on record. Scientists say the world is now closer to breaching the critical 2 degrees Celsius warming mark, which the 2015 Paris Accords considered a tipping point in global warming. Ishan Garg reports from Brussels. 
Copernicus Climate Change Service says the global mean temperature between February 23 to January 24 was the highest ever at 15.02 degrees. That means the average temperature across the globe rose by 1.52 degrees compared to pre-industrial levels. In 2015, world leaders agreed to keep global warming well below 2 degrees Celsius and to aim for only 1.5 degrees. The 2 degree mark is believed to be the tipping point after which many impacts of climate change could become irreversible. This year's increase doesn't yet break the Paris Agreement, which refers to an average global temperature over decades. But some scientists say governments need to do more to limit the rising temperatures. Ashan Gerg, Brussels. One million dollars to climate scientist Michael Mann, who sued a pair of right-wing writers 12 years ago after they compared his depictions of global warming to a convicted child molester. Mann, a professor of climate science at the University of Pennsylvania, rose to fame for a graph first published in 1998 in the journal Nature that was dubbed the Hockey Stick for its dramatic graphic illustration of a warming planet. The work brought Mann wide exposure, but also many skeptics, including the two writers that Mann took to court for comments that he said affected his career and reputation in the United States and internationally. In 2012, a libertarian think tank named the Competitive Enterprise Institute published a blog post by Rand Simberg, then a fellow at the organization, that compared investigations into man's work by Penn State University to the case of Jerry Sandusky, a former assistant football coach who was convicted of sexually assaulting multiple children. Mann's research was investigated after he and other scientists' emails were leaked in 2009 in an incident known as Climate Gate that brought further scrutiny of the hockey stick graph, with skeptics claiming Mann had manipulated data. Investigations by Penn State and others, including the Associated Press, found no misuse of data by Mann, but his work continued to draw attacks, particularly from conservatives. Mann could be said to be the Jerry Sandusky of climate science, except for instead of molesting children, he has molested and tortured data, Simberg wrote. Another writer, Mark Stain, later referenced Simberg's article in his own piece in National Review, calling Mann's research fraudulent. Six-person jury in Superior Court of the District of Columbia announced its verdict after four weeks of trial and one day of deliberations, awarding man in excess of $1 million. Here in the Bay Area, Antioch Mayor Lamar Hernandez Thorpe signed a pledge and a proclamation refusing to invest public dollars in oil and gas infrastructure citing the costly impacts of fossil fuel-driven climate change on the city of Antioch and its infrastructure. The mayor says climate change is here and is already being felt. In the last few days, California was hit with damaging and life-threatening rain, wind, and flooding. Uh, and it only gets worse from there. Not every part of our planet is experiencing climate change in the same fashion. For Antioch, atmospheric ri rivers pose huge threats to our already strained infrastructure. Roads will continue to deteriorate and crumble at a faster rate than before. There are parts of our city that can't drain storm water because the delta s tides are so high when it rains, it doesn't even push the water out. A few days ago, our public works team had to pump water out of the marina adjacent to several parking lots because there was nowhere for the water to go. The group Pacific Environment developed the pledge. Hernandez Thorpe is the first mayor to sign on to it. Fossil fuels, including coal, oil, and gas, are the largest contributors to global warming, accounting for 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions, 90% of all carbon dioxide emissions. Wayne State University in Detroit has been awarded a grant by the Detroit Zoological Society to conduct research on bird mortality from window strikes. Farah Siddiqui has the story. 
Ava Landruff with the Detroit Bird Alliance says more than half of the bird window strikes happen at low-rise and residential buildings and not on skyscrapers as most would imagine. Most people don't know that bird window collisions are the second highest cause of direct human-caused mortality of birds and this is surpassed only by outdoor and feral cats. The Smithsonian Institution finds that many bird window strikes happen because of less darkness at night and an increase in artificial light caused by street lights and lighted office buildings. The research shows 33% of the world's population cannot see the Milky Way galaxy due to light pollution, and for birds that navigate using the stars, this hazy sky is causing deadly results. Landraff says Wayne State University faculty and students have had concerns about bird strikes over the years, but the opportunity to do something about it never materialized until they got this grant. She adds that it's scary to find a small number of dead birds around the campus knowing that there are many window strikes. A lot of the birds will hit a window, have that head trauma, and then fly off and then die later. Even if they hit the window and they die right there, they're either picked up and eaten by a scavenger or the building caretaker just sweep the birds right up. Based on the Detroit Bird Alliance's findings from tracking bird strikes, Kaleidoscape, an adhesive film that reduces reflections outside, was applied on the first and second floor windows of the law school building at the university as part of the research. She suggests that people contact the Detroit Bird Alliance for ideas on other solutions. She also suggests checking birdmapper.org to see which areas experience more bird window strikes around the world. I'm Farah Siddiqui. An inquest into Canada's deadliest stabbing incident in history is over, and 29 recommendations have been put forward. Miles Sanderson killed 11 people in the James Smith Cree Nation in September of 2022, leaving the community in shock. Dan Karpinchuk reports. The 29 recommendations include better access to addictions and cultural programming in prisons, reforms to how inmates are allowed on supervised release, and having those with a history of domestic violence given a higher priority for arrest when it comes to breaking release conditions. Miles Sanderson was in breach of his parole conditions at the time. Chelsea Stonestand speaks for the Burns family, which lost six members. It's not perfect recommendations, but it's practical. At the end of the day, I think there's comfort in this inquest and the recommendations that are going to be implemented. The inquest was also told that inmates who receive psychiatric care in federal prisons are released with a week's worth of medication and then left to find their own doctor. Sanderson had been taking medications for ADHD while in prison. There were also recommendations for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police for more engagement with parole officers, more officers in some locations, and better communications with First Nations leaders. Rhonda Blackmore is the commanding officer for the RCMP in Saskatchewan. I think because there is a lot of positivity that can come out of those recommendations, uh, that we will work very hard to address those recommendations and, uh, and do what we can to, uh, to implement. Some First Nations leaders say the challenge now will be to make sure that affected agencies will act on the recommendations, which are non-binding. Some of those leaders have also called for a national inquiry into the killings. For National Native News, I'm Dan Karpinchuk. President Biden and First Lady Jill Biden held a reception celebrating Black History Month in the East Room of the White House, along with Vice President Kamala Harris, playing host to more than 500 black community leaders, activists, and business professionals. Norman Hall reports. Speaking at a White House Black History Gathering with Vice President Kamala Harris, President Joe Biden hosted dignitaries including Wes Moore, Maryland's first black governor. The president credited the support of black voters for being elected. Biden said black history is American history and urged harmony. Let's reflect on how we make history, not erase history, you know. In the midst of a re-election bid, the president joked that he would host a similar event next February. Norman Hall, Washington. Partly cloudy skies tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area, around the Bay and in the inland valleys with highs in the mid-50s. It's the same forecast for the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow. Partly cloudy skies, highs in the mid-50s. That is it for the news tonight for this Thursday, February 8th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. Palestinian-American human rights attorney Nora Erekat. There has been a priming that all of these mass atrocities 
will be accepted by a population who will watch it with lament, but think to themselves, but what else was Israel supposed to do? We are all being primed to accept mass atrocities. This historically is the playbook of how genocides happen. What we are seeing is a genocidal campaign. You cannot forcibly transfer 1.1 million Palestinians in a 225 square mile enclosed area. There is nowhere for them to go. Storytelling for social change on KPFA. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K24 8BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org.